Hi friends, this is Joe. This is the second week for OSR October 2024. And if you're looking at me and you just watched the last one and you're saying, hey Joe, didn't you wear that shirt last week? Yeah, I did. And that's because I'm recording these episodes back to back because I'm working <laughs> next weekend when I normally record these. And so, uh, yeah, and so I am. This week we are talking about the original magic system in uh, Blackmore. Like I said, last week for OSA October, uh, I am each week just taking a random paragraph in the first fantasy campaign book uh, that was published by Judges Guild back in the late 70s or 1980, and just looking at how things were done back in the day. And then I'm giving my thoughts and how I might apply those today. So today is the original magic system. And it's very different. Let's uh, take a look. In Blackmore, magic followed the formula pattern for most magic. The reason behind limiting the number of spells that a magic user could take down into the dungeon was simply that many of the ingredients had to be prepared ahead of time. And, of course, once used, were then powerless. Special adventurers could then be organized by the parties to gain some of the special ingredients that could only be found in some dangerous place. Progression reflected the increasing ability of the magic user to mix spells of greater and greater complexity. Study and practice were the most important factors involved. A magic user did not progress unless he used spells, either in the dungeon or in practice. There was no difference. Sessions. And since there was always a chance of failure in spells, unless they were practice, and materials for some spells were limited determined by simply a die roll, the magic user did not just go around practicing all the time. The magic user could practice low-level spells all the time, cheaply and safely, but his constitution determined how often he could practice without rest. Thus, adventurers might want a magic user to come with them only to find him lying exhausted. So to progress to a new level, one first learned the spells, then got to use that spell. There was no automatic progression, Rather, was a slow step-by-step, spell-by-spell progression. <laughs> that is very different from the Vancing system that we see in Dungeons & Dragons, you know, the one that eventually got published. And I think I kind of like this system better, except there's a whole lot more up to GM Fiat, which, if you're a bad GM, you could use to screw over the players, which the solution is don't be a bad GM. If you've ever read the game of Dungeon, not the board game, but the role-playing game that someone in the Twin Cities uh, published when they were exposed secondhand, one of Gygax's players was then trying to play, you know, uh, run a D&D game for this person, and they wrote down, you know, their experiences thinking it was something new and unique. Uh, that is available, by the way, on uh, John Peterson's website. I'll put a link in the show notes if I remember. Anyway, if you ever read that, magic work there that they would find spells. And elsewhere in uh, the first fantasy campaign, um, Guy, uh, Arneson talks about um, different places having factories that made spells for people. So spells were things. And that's when he says a formula, he doesn't mean, I don't think, like mathematical things. He means like potions, right? You needed the ingredients to mix the potions and you would bring them down. In the game of Dungeon, there were these orbs that you would take and once you used, they were useless. I, I find it fascinating. I like it. I like it a lot. I have toyed with the idea of running D&D &D with no memorized spells. Instead of like using the rules out of the Holmes edition where spells could be written down onto a scroll, but that's all you have. You don't have any other um, spells, just the scrolls. Or to use like an artificial system where you can make the magic items, but then once used, you have to remake them. It would make for a di very different type world. I don't think you could call it your typical D&D &D world at that point, but I think it could make for interesting play. And uh, yeah, it's just, in fact, I have a rather complex set of rules for making magical devices and um, not devices, things. Um, and it's one of those things where you tell the GM what you want and then the GM will tell you, you know, 
how much it will cost to create the item. And again, once you use the item, it's useless. And uh, he'll tell you how long it will take and stuff like that. And I even have options in there for, uh, if you want to make it quicker, you can do it. It will cost more, maybe a chance of failure if you want it, you know, if you can take longer, maybe get it cheaper, stuff like that. Uh, I wrote them using, what did I use? <laughs> I used, um, wow, just left my brain. <laughs> I use, oh, I used the Anime D20 rules because they're OGL and uh, there's enough different powers in there that you could uh, mix and match and they uh, have prices associated with them in terms of character points. And I just converted that using a formula to gold points and time and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I've always found this single-use magic to be interesting. Even before I got this book, and I found that, hey, that's how Arneson did it. And uh, that just makes me like it more. And I really want to try it, but I never have. Uh, what do you think? What do you think of a spell being an object that you take with you, be it a scroll or a potion or some sort of device? What do you think? Okay, so part two of this week's episode, still talking about magic and Blackmore, is the list of magic items that he lists. Let's take a look at them. The first one I'm going to say is the tricorder. The tricorder will give the operator complete physical information about any item it is pointed at. It has a range of 100 yards. Only metal will block its effect. We'll only give out information that it's specifically asked so saying, tell me everything, we'll get an automatic 30-day lecture on the basic universe, which will run its course no matter what the operator does. Similar answers to other general questions have also occurred. Another one is the medical unit, which will heal all wounds within 24 hours, but you, can get, yeah, but you cannot get out early. Uh, another one that we're going to look at briefly is an educator. It teaches you how to use these mechanical marvels. One tape in a machine, other tapes can be used as treasure finds, etc. There's a few more. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, maybe you saw them on screen. I, just, I find this interesting. This is for people that say that science fiction does not belong in Dungeons & Dragons, in their fantasy game. It has always been in the game. Uh, the very history of Blackmore Castle itself is that it's built on the ruins, the ruins? Well, the remains of a crashed spaceship, right? Um, and then there, what is it? White Blue Mountain, I think, is the D&D &D adventure with the spaceship. But, I mean, the tricorder, I, I love that description for a tricorder. I so want to put that into a game. Uh, and the healing pod, that's definitely a, a science fiction device, right? And... There's robots and the, the tapes and the machines that teach you how to use them. It's, it's, it's cool. I like it. <laughs> what do you think? Um, the other thing is there's no need to tell the player, hey, you have a tricorder. Tell them that there's this wooden box that when you say something, it talks back to you or make it a crystal ball or whatever. Give it that fantasy trapping. The healing pod could be like a giant healing plant, you know, kind of like Audrey 2 in Little Shop of Horrors. But instead of eating you, it just puts you there and then it heals you and lets you up. Or at least that's how the player could think of it. I once ran a game of Gamma World for my friend Peter and James that I didn't tell them it was Gamma World. I just dressed it up as fantasy. They rolled up their characters. Yep. If they had mutations, I just told them that, hey, your character has this particular ability, right? And in a fantasy world, a, a mutated bear um, isn't really going to be that different, right? In fact, if you grow up with a, a bunch of other mutated bears, that's just your race. That's your werebear race. Well, werebear means you can transform, but you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, and when they came across artifacts, I just described them as magic items. And it, it was cool. Um, I was waiting for them to catch on. They never said that they did. Maybe they did and they just didn't say. I don't know. Uh, but it was cool and it was a fun game. And they enjoyed it. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that's the end of this week's episode. Again, short episode. I like short episodes. 
Thanks for watching and your listening. Please let me know what you think. Uh, the comments below. You can leave feedback. Feedback at techiehedron.com. You know all the ways. They're in the show notes in any case. Uh, thanks for watching and your listening. Until next week, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Techiehedron RPG podcast. Please come back.